Good evening and uh, welcome to this special online FAIN event uh, where I, Mike Parkinson, are going to be speaking to my father, Michael Parkinson, uh, about this book that we've co-authored called Like Father, Like Son, which looks at the relationship that he had with his dad and indeed the relationship that I had with him, but also the relationship we both had with an extraordinary man, John William Parkinson, my grandfather. I'm going to start the interview, if I may, with a quote, because you often do this to, to people. You, you, you hijack them with quotes that they regret saying. Um, and it's, this happened in a, uh, an interview in 1971. Uh, and the interviewer asked you about uh, the idea that you were going to think of writing a novel that will hark back to Barnsley in the old days. And your answer was, I've got a novel in my head. I know the title and I know the cover. It's called Like Father, Like Son. That's 1971. Why did it take you so long? <laughs> <laughs> well, it seemed like a good idea then. That seemed like a less than a good idea when you think of what we have to do to sit down to write a book. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I was always fascinated by, by my father's hands. He, he had the son, hands of a son of toil, basically. He was a miner all his life, from 14 onwards. And so he had these, these big and, and horny hands, you know, and rough hands. And I used to think, you know, when I looked at my own hands, I mean, I'm doing a day's work in their life, that basically that summed up our life together. Mm. And I had this idea of doing a book which would have our, our, our palms on it, my dad's and mine mm. like that. And and you could tell immediately just by looking at it what the book was about. Yeah, I, I suppose I suppose any project it, 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 it's often to do with with time and, and opportunity. And I suppose at that time, 1971, you were just starting your career as a talk show yeah. host. You were a very busy journalist. You yeah. had a young family. It was probably in the back of your mind. What's interesting is that fast forward to what maybe two years ago when you did Piers Morgan's interview. Mm. And that really brought this whole issue back to the mm. forefront, didn't it? I mean, Indeed. I was there at the recording, um, and I, I don't want to, to just tell me what happened at, that, at the interview that made you think this book is, is well, time to write. Well, we'd had a bit of uh, jocular uh, uh, night before, <laughs> Piers and I, because we're old friends, and they were saying, you know, you'll be crying away there, uh, and all that. And I said, there's no way you can make me cry. And the only thing that would make me cry would be a, m a memory of my father. And, uh, but he just popped this question in, what were my thoughts when, when my father died? I was there that day when he died, and, and it was that question that kind of, I don't know, I, 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 it stunned me in a sense. I mean, I, I wasn't expecting it, but I, it wasn't like I wasn't there and I didn't see it happen. But as soon as I started remembering that moment, when he was carried downstairs in a body bag by two guys, mm. like a sort of parcel, delivery by whatever, you know, I mean, it just, it was so, banal uh, and unfitting for such a good man. Uh, it turned on, on, on a part of grief that I thought I'd buried away. Mm. And what I learned about grief in that time was that you don't bury it, it doesn't go away. No. It lurks. Yeah. It's like some terrible virus that yeah. is still there. And you might manage to drink it out of your system or whatever it might be, you can know, see a good psychiatrist, but it's still lurking there. And I suppose, in a way, it's a definition of the love you have for one person. Mm. I mean, it, it was interesting being an observer to that because, I mean, I, I, I kind of knew that, that Piers would do that. And he's very skillful the way he does his interview. I mean, he, he, I mean you, you made the point that you often think that the people who are actually on the show cry because they're desperate to go home <laughs> because the record time was about three and a half hours. This was about three hours in. Yeah. But I, I have to say, as a son... It affected me because I was shocked by the power of your emotion. And, yeah. it, and that conversation we had afterwards to say, maybe we should write this book. That's right. And we decided to write it. Uh, and the idea that came to us, the, the publisher said, was it an easy book for you to start to write? Well, I suppose it was in the sense that I wouldn't be wanting to do it. Yeah. Um, but there's a long degree of separation between that and actually sitting down and doing a mm. book. I mean, it's, it's a... It's a hell of a job writing a book. Yeah. I mean, compared to television, it's yeah. television is easy compared to that. Yeah. So I wasn't looking forward to that, but I mean, I have to say, pay you the tribute by saying that, and I couldn't have done it without you, mm. because you guided me through it. Now, when there's a bad period where I had to go in hospital uh, for a couple of weeks or so with you know, my gallstones seen to, shattered, exploded, or whatever they do to them. Uh, and I came out, and I think because of the consequences of the drugs I've been on, this sort of thing, I could not write for the first time since I've been 16 when I came into the, 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 the game of journalism. The, I, I didn't have a thought in my head, and I couldn't, I didn't even know how to type or write. It was sort of awful. I sat there like a dummy. And at that point, you took over. I mm. mean, and, and you, you wrote a considerable 
part of the book, which I think is, is almost the best part of it, the book. It's, it, it was an interesting experience because I, I was witness to that. I was witness to the way that as much as you wanted to, you, you couldn't actually get away into no. it. And so I was kind of left in this strange limbo where there I was in the middle of a lockdown, in the middle of a, of a pandemic, where the world was silent. You were effectively silent. And I was faced with this book. <laughs> and uh, and one of the ideas the publisher had was they were going to get a collection of the uh, of the articles you've written about the father and yeah. use that as a basis of it. Yeah. When I got them all, they were brilliant, but they actually only formed a very that we would have produced a nice pamphlet. So I was faced with this very strange thing of how are we going to get this into a form of a book, and that's sort of how it organically developed. We'll, we'll talk about it a bit later, but one of the things I discovered very interesting. I want to ask you about this was. I once was watching Steve Coogan and, and Rob Brydon on one of their trips abroad, yes. and, he, and I was laughing, as you probably probably react in a different way, when Brydon does an impersonation of you, yeah, uh, which, which we, we find hilarious, and you just find like anyone who's interviewed, like, <laughs> that doesn't even look like me, or sound like me. So, But he, he kept doing this thing where he would always say, you know, tell me about your father. <laughs> and I thought, how interesting. I wondered if that was something that was actually – we picked up because you asked a lot about it. I mean, were you, when you did your interview show, were you that in particularly interested in that relationship? I didn't realize until Rob Brown informed me of the fact. <laughs> I think, like, the great thing about humor is yeah. good humor yeah. is that they take these little foibles That's right. that you have of speech or whatever mm. and they turn it into something which becomes funny. And I didn't realize I did that until he <laughs> told me, so I, I owe my debt. Uh, yeah, so it played, played a part. I mean, my father had a sense of humor, a lovely sense of humor. And I and I wrote a series of articles for the Sunday Times and Punch and various yeah. other magazines about my father. Yeah. And they're all funny. Yeah. They're all about incidents in my life, which is, I reflected in the book and didn't quite understand it until it came our turn to write the book. That in fact, that when people, when you told people as I was growing up and moving through, you know, London society and all that stuff, that you came from a mining village, mm. they almost shied away. Mm. They felt sorry for you. Mm. They wanted to take you into a rest home somewhere mm. and uh, cool down your fever. Bro. Yeah. And I had to try to explain to them, it was the most glorious upbringing for a child anybody could ever have. Yeah. And the humor that I showed about my father was not because he's a particularly a comic man or anything like that, but because he represented had the joyfulness of being in that community and of feeling safe. I mean, the, the best thing a child can ever feel is safe. And mm. I felt safe all the time. So, in fact, it was a reaction to that conception there had been, and people feeling sorry for it because you came from a pit village. I didn't ever felt that way, and I wanted to, to redress that. What you did, I think, which was mm. interesting, mm. because you can't live by jokes alone, <laughs> is that you did something which I would have found much more difficult to do. You looked at the business of being a miner. Yes. You looked at the, yes. without actually have, ever having you know, <laughs> been there, but, but you, you, you did your research, you went down a pitch, there were yeah. a few pits left over now, and you did all the proper research, and you came out with, a, I think, the, the soul of the, of the book, mm. uh, which was, you know, this was a dreadful, awful, nasty, foul job of to course, do. Yeah. And that to survive it was mm. sufficient, yeah. but survive it with humor, yeah. with being with good-natured resolve, yeah. was something else altogether. Yeah, I mean, that's what I found most remarkable about him. I mean, I started from the point of view of he was a beloved grandfather, and I knew mm. how much you loved him. But it was, it's very easy for to fall into being becoming mawkish about it. But every person I spoke to in the family reacted the same way. Yes. My brothers were the same. You know, he, he's, he's, my, my, my grand's half-sister was the same. They adored him. They said, yeah. And then I thought, well, how can this man who worked for six days a week, 40-odd years of his life, down a hole in the ground in the most <laughs> appalling conditions, how did he emerge to be that happy? Mm. And he was. And that's the most extraordinary thing mm. about him. And, and he, he, what comes through with, with, with him and, and you is, is that he never wanted you and, indeed, never wanted his wife to ever feel touched by what he went through. Yeah. He did everything in his power to prevent you feeling his pain, his his misery that he must have felt when he was down there. I mean, the, the, the story you've told before, but it bears a retelling, is that is that time he took you down the pit yes. for the very reason to stop you wanting to become a miner. Exactly. He took me down Grandthorpe Colliery. He was a deputy at the time, an older man. Uh, so he had the right to take somebody down there. He took me down there. And they dropped me like a stone, like a mile down, you know. Oh, God. And that was just the start of it. And then it got into the real business of it because it was a working pit as a day shift. And the men working on their bellies and seams about that high, you know, and 10 tons of coal getting out a day and all that. And uh, 
and the job didn't start till they crawled on their bellies to get to the coal face and start digging the coal mm -hmm. out, you know. Uh, it foul and it frightened me. The noise, the machinery was appalling. The, the air was thick with dust and things. It was terrifying. Yeah. And, and I was I was properly frightened. And I had no idea, really, that that's what it was like. No. Because um, my father had never moaned about it, never tried to explain it at all to no. me in, in any such terms. Uh, but he, you know, he, he kept all that misery away from us. And I wondered myself if I could do the same, if I'd been in his situation working down a pit for as long as, as he did. Anyway, we, we went through all of it and we were walking home and uh, he was a, dropped a bit behind me and then he said to me, uh, what do you reckon? And I said, uh, not much. And he said, no, he said, uh, what's your real feeling? I said, you won't get me down there for a thousand quid a shift. And he said, that's absolutely right. He said, that's what I wanted to do here. But you should know it. <laughs> if ever I see you at the pit gates looking for a job, I'll kick your ass all the way home. <laughs> so, that was the end of it. I yeah. know my ambition to be a miner. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, is, it is a remarkable story, and he was a remarkable man. But I couldn't tell the story without talking about the other remarkable person in your life, which was your mother. Yes. Uh, because, you know, she was part and parcel of what? drove in. She was part and parcel of that safe environment at home. Yes. And she was remarkable because I, I, I say in the book that through her own efforts, you know, she, she pulled one man from the darkness and sent the other man on his way to the stars. And yeah. that's how important she was. Yeah. I mean, how did she achieve that? What, what, I mean, what did she do for both of you? Well, I was a, it was a consequence of her frustrated ambition. I yeah. mean, my mum was a very bright, intelligent woman who today would have walked into any university mm -hmm. and, uh, and she made a living in a mining village in, 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 in Yorkshire uh, by designing knitwear patterns, yeah. knitwear pullovers and things like coats uh, for uh, firms in London. And she used to do these patterns. She would go to a movie, which she went four nights a week with her, and she'd sit there knitting away in the, in the darkness, and at the end of it, she got a fair house sweater. I mean, mm. it was quite extraordinary. Mm. She was a magician. Uh, and through that, she, she financed an independence for herself, which allowed her to actually say to me and to my father, look, you know, don't underachieve. Yeah. You know, don't be what I've been felt all my life, a failure. Yeah. And my father was just content to be a miner, I can call, and she said to him, you're better than that. Go yeah. and be a deputy, a boss. Yeah. He didn't want to, but she made him, basically. Mm. And I remember sitting there doing my homework with my father, on the odd occasion I did the homework, <laughs> I remember my father sitting opposite with this big blue bound book, uh, which he got from his corner of the college, about the mining industry and being tested through it by my mother to the point where he got through the examination yeah. and became the boss and that sort of thing. So he would never have done that without yeah, her ambition. Yeah. So she channeled and fed her ambition through the two of us. Yeah. And she did not a bad job. Either. She did, she did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. she, she, was, she was a formidable woman. I mean, he, as we've said before, when he emerged from that pit, he, he wanted to not just clean the coal dust off, he wanted to leave any vestige behind. Yeah. And that meant he just attacked everything with great gusto. That's right. And the, the place where you really did meet him as a father was on the sports field. Yes. Um, that's where your relationship was formed, that's where your love of sport came from. Yes. And one of the, and, and but the thing about my father, my grandfather, I remember, is that it was, it, cricket was, was the church, yes. but any sport was worth following. Absolutely any sport. And, and I want you to recount the time when he decided that he wanted you to become a boxer to oh. learn the sweet science of boxing. I, uh, my, my father was a pacifist. He got to learn where he got this idea from. He came out of the blue. He said, I've, I've arranged for you. He said, I bought you a pair of boxing gloves. I said, what are you boxing gloves for? I kind of like fighting. No, he said, you should learn the art of noble art of defense. I said, well, what do I do now? He said, well, he said, I have my mate down the way, Billy Taylor. He said, his lad, he said, uh, he's, he's a good boxer. I said, he's a good fighter, street fighter. He needed to join the commander of this guy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, I had a wigwam in my garden, a red wigwam with a, with a, a, a golden moon on it and all that sort of thing, which I, I used to just play around with. And so it was there, that was a changing room. So Billy Taylor got, and it was built like a brick outhouse, Billy, you know, and I was a skinny little kid. So all these gloves that my dad had bought me, the car care, I also remember that car care. And, uh, and I, I just wasn't quite sure what I was supposed to do. Anyway, my dad said, wait, well, right, round one. And Billy Taylor came out, him, and then he went, bang, and he went straight in the nose. <laughs> 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 and the blood came out in a torrent. All of, my mother had been watching this through the kitchen window, came running out. Like, my father was terrible bollocking, a terrible <laughs> And Billy Taylor said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah, I, uh, 
I said, no, I walked into it, boom. <laughs> anyway, so that was how long it lasted. It yes. lasted about 10 seconds. Yes. Uh, from which point on, I mean, my father was, the, the, I was uh, assured that his son would not be a prize fighter, and I was certain I wouldn't be a prize fighter. <laughs> but it was just, and now, where he got that from, I just don't know. No. My mother was so angry, she made us sleep in the tent yes. overnight. Yes. Well, we could talk about it, but we didn't talk about it at all. So I still haven't worked out to this day I, why he would have put me through that. Well, I think what he was doing, I think he was preparing you for your, your meeting in 1974 with the World Heavyweight <laughs> Champion of the World. Ah. Now, this is a classic clip which I want to show because there's a wonderful story about my grandfather's reaction mm. to the time <laughs> that Muhammad Ali took great exception to you asking him a simple question. Let's take a look at this. Can I just put one to yeah, you that, that he says? He says... He's devoted to a religious movement that looks on the white race as devils, whose time of deserved destruction is at hand, and yet keeps in almost daily touch with white friends like Gene Kilroy and Hal Conrad. In fact, he's got more genuine white friends than almost any black fighter I've ever known. Now, isn't there a contrast there? You belong to a faith which teaches separatism, which we mm. talked bef before about mm. when you came on my program. Yet here, you see, and I know it's true, I've, I've seen it, you have white friends. No, I got a lot of white socials. Elijah Muhammad, the one who preached at the white man of America, number one is the devil. He's been preaching. He's never mentioned England. England people have never lynched us, raped us, castrated us, tarred and feathered us, burned us up, pulled our sockets apart, stick knives and pregnant women's stomach, enslave us, rob us of our name, our knowledge, our God. Elijah Muhammad has been preaching that the white man of America, God taught him, is the blue-eyed, blonde-headed devil. No good in him, no justice. He's going to be destroyed. His rule is over. He is the devil. Now, Elijah Muhammad preaches that. Now, I'm a hypocrite because I got a white fellow working for me in all white white country. I'm here because I got white no, fans. No, no, this no, is I silly. No, so why'd you read something like this? He used to say, ain't you, you contradicting? No, I ain't you no that nothing. You, you, no, you, you, I done you, read you, did, you, you and I done no. got, came on you. You don't. You ain't used to no black man and mainly no boxer having no sense. I'm not just a boxer. I'm taught by Elijah Muhammad. I'm educated. Even Oxford University, your biggest seat of learning, offered me a professorship in philosophy and poetry to come in to teach. I'm not just a fighter. I can talk all week on millions of subjects and you do not have enough wisdom to corner me on television. You do not have enough. You are too small mentally to tackle me on nothing that I represent. <laughs> I'm serious. You and this little TV show is nothing to Muhammad Ali. And if you got some more questions, I'll ask them. And I bet you I'll eat you up right here on there. It ain't no way you can tackle me. Ain't no way. You can't beat me physically nor mentally. You are really a joke. <laughs> I mean, the funny thing about that was my grandfather was there at that recording. He was. And, um, uh, and he, he came back to see you after that. He did. He came, knocked on the door of my dressing room, came back I didn't feel very happy about what had gone on. I mean, he was a curious man, Ali, and I yeah. interviewed him what, four or five times. Yeah. He was a man of very mo many, many moods. And, and in the end, you know, no matter what about his tirade about these people were assisting him at the time, where were they when he, when he toward the end no when way. he was dying? Nowhere. Anyway. But the point was that there was a knock on my dressing room door, and I wasn't in the best of moods, and I opened it, and my father was there. And he said, now then. Now, now then is a very old way of saying, uh, I don't know what I'm doing here, really, but I'll go ahead in any case. So he said, <laughs> I said, yeah, what do you want, Dad? Well, he said, I want to ask you a question. I said, um, what's that? He said, what did I rate to that out there? I said, not much. He said, no, did I? He said, R. Michael, and I knew when he said R. Michael, I was, I was in trouble. <laughs> Can I ask you a serious question? I said, yes, Dad, you know, but what could I have done? He said, why don't I thump him? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> You see, it's the most sensible thing I did all day. You see, there's, there's, there's a link between that time in, this, in your garden when you were a kid, the Baba Dali, and all that training was wasted on you, wasn't it? Oh, dear. It's terrible. Oh dear. But I mean, that, that goes to the heart. I mean, he, 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 both my, my gran and, and, and my grandfather, they went to every single show and they absolutely they reveled in your success yeah. in, in a very way. They were very proud of you. I mean, I mean, were you aware of, uh, of how proud he was of you? Did, did, he, did he make it clear of how proud he was to you? Well, he didn't in, in as many terms, but he didn't need to. No. Uh, I mean, I was a very uh, happy child and a very self-assured self child in the sense that I felt, I felt unthreatened by mm. things. I felt confident enough to go out into the world and into a society which I hadn't been born into, no. which was a tough one too. But because of just their, their love, but they didn't have to tell me every day. I knew it, yeah. so I took it for granted. Yeah. So it never bothered me. You know, yeah. just in, and it wasn't until I came to, to help you write the book that I, I, I sort of started trying to explain to myself these, these feelings. I mean, what, how deep was that love? I mean, 
Oh, and how did he manage, and she managed too, to create out of a very ordinary circumstance mm. a, a kind of paradise. Yeah. That, that was the amazing trick that they both did. He was he surrounded himself with with just just madness. I mean, I remember it as going on a holiday with him to to a holiday camp, and um, and he was not well. I mean, this was probably a couple of years before he before he passed away. So he was on a very regime of heart pills, and he was going there to rest. But I mean, he didn't rest. He had three grandsons. Well, the, yeah. and, he, and, he, and he basically entered us into every single possible competition. Exactly. Crazy golf, water polo. He couldn't swim. He couldn't swim. No. I no. mean, so he's the only uh, one I've done. He had, he had uh, he crazy golf, which my, my eldest brother today is convinced he cheated him out of it. <laughs> out of it. Um, he, 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 he won dominoes because he cheated. Uh, we had a, a, a Lancashire family next door to us in the next set chalet. So we had cricket all the time. He, he was, he was a remarkable man in that sense. He used to go looking for uh, Lancashire families. He did. On the beach at Scarborough. He did, yes. Anybody here from Lancashire might say to the side. Yes. And then they organised a cricket match against him, <laughs> which he would cheat at he because what he used to do, he, this is true, he used to study the tides. <laughs> and the rule was, but if the ball went into the sea, it was yes. a six. Yes. Right? So you yes. needed to know when it was high tide. <laughs> right? <laughs> and if, if, if it was in there in the morning when we started, you could bet your bottom dollar. If he won the toss, they battered. <laughs> he was lovely. It's, um, it's more than that, though, really, about your book. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very affectionate book. It's, it's a funny book. But I suppose, given the fact that, that I was sort of set this task because of various things, that it turned into something different. Um, and there is, a, there, there is an, an, an aspect of the book where I begin to examine my relationship with you uh, and also my thoughts about my grandfather and my grandmother. And I have to say, it was difficult for me to write because I felt I had to be honest. Um, and there are a few things that I was concerned about you reading when I gave it to you. What, what, what do you feel when you read it now? I, I, in fact, when I read your, your contribution on that uh, area of my life, about my parents particularly, particularly my mother, mm. um, I, I had to admit that I was rather... Shock's the wrong word. I was disappointed mm. that, uh, that, that you had found a, at times to be difficult mm. to be. Mm. Uh, and yet when I then sat down and thought about it and stripped it all back and thought, well, come on, don't invent it, think about it as it really was, I could see why you might have thought that. Mm. And so and I thought too that if you're going to do that, you've got to be honest. I mean, mm. there's no good telling lies about it. No. Uh, and, and it wasn't anything that, that my mother would have disagreed with, I no. think. You know, she was very aware of what she was. She yeah. was very aware of how driven she was. She was very aware of how ambitious she was for other people. Mm. And she was very aware too for all her life about how thwarted she felt. Yeah. Uh, cheated for, yeah. from an education. She mm. was. I mean, her brother went to, to university, and of course the family, being, being an older brother, uh, took out a loan, which was still paying off when her brother was about 34. Mm. Uh, and so all the spare money from the family had gone into him, him and not her. Mm. And that she carried with her. Now, you mustn't think that she was a, a, she was a sort of, a, I don't know, a difficult woman in that sense. She, she wasn't. She, she'd accepted what was wrong, but she then, therefore, the positive side, <clears throat> well, she channeled all her ambition through me. Mm. And through my, I mean, my mother, the worst moment in my mother's life, and I can still see a, a disappointment in her eyes now, was when I got a job away from the South Yorkshire Times, the Barnsley Chronicle, onto the Yorkshire Evening Post in Doncaster. Yeah. And she was overjoyed at the thought. And I said, well, you know, I'll be living in a flat in Doncaster. She said, what? Mm. I said, I'll be leaving the house. Mm. She said, you can't do that. I said, mom, I'm 20 <laughs> and I'm going to go. I've got, I can't yeah, work yeah, from yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. And she hadn't quite worked that one no. out. It's an interesting story you tell about the fact that she loved you so much. She worked very hard to let you go. Did, mm. did you ever feel, as I felt, that, that there was an element where she found it difficult to share you with other people? That's an interesting thought. Mm. I never really thought about that. I, uh, I never thought, frankly, that, that I could stir that emotion in anybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, even my mother, no, I, I don't know, maybe. I, I never felt a cloying presence. No, I never felt that she, she dominated my, my life or changed my attitude toward people. Toward. I've always been fairly gregarious with people. Yeah. I've always been mixed easily. And I was just so generally delighted not to have a problem uh, which other friends of mine had of, of coming from a household which was very different yes. to mine. Yeah. I mean, I lived in an area where, you know, let's not paint too fine a picture of the mining community. 
there was drunkenness, there mm. was violence mm. and all that. And I remember going into a couple of my friends' houses and, and seeing the consequences of that, you know, mm. women being beaten up and that sort of mm. thing. Mm. But you kind of looked at and accepted that, then thank God, thought, thank God I, I don't have to go yeah. through that, you yeah. know. The other aspect of the book that, that, I, that I kind of was fascinated about in, in investigating was the way that this one man touched all of us in different mm. ways, touched different generations. Mm. You know, he, he, he became in, in, in many ways a kind of surrogate father to my, to my eldest, uh, uh, my, sorry, my, the eldest of the family, my eldest brother, because you weren't because of your job, weren't around to it necessarily. But also he was hugely important in, 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 in my mum's life, you, you know, your, your wife Mary's life. Yes. Um, and their relationship was was remarkable, wasn't it? Mm. I mean, they they found a kindred spirit. Absolutely. Them, you know? Well, I mean, she lost her dad when she yeah. was young. Uh, he was a minor too. He was an Irishman, came a farmer, came across the auction work in the pits. Yeah. Died when she was about 14, 15. Her mother died as well. So <clears throat> she was separated from that which I'd had, mm. that, that safety feeling of being at home. She never had that. But she found it with my father particularly. Yeah. Uh, and she adored him, and he adored her. Yeah. So we had that very great. She, he became, in a sense, her dad. Yeah. And it was a very, very important relationship with the two of them. It and was. It, was, it was. It was fascinating to watch the yeah. intertwining of this Irish girl, yeah. wonderfully funny, d dancing girl, and this 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 old miner who uh, I think was in love with her. I suppose the other difficult thing for me was to be honest in the book about my early relationship with you, yes, um, and indeed your relationship with all of us growing up. Um, I described you in, in the book as, as, a, as a disquieting presence at times, uh, at meal times and, and all that. And, you know, if the difficulty with all that was, I didn't want to sound like an ungrateful, an ingrate. I mean, no. here I am, you know, having a wonderful upbringing and all that, and suddenly sort of doing that terrible thing you see in tabloids, like, you know, oh, woe is me. Um, but I thought it was important that I kind of expressed uh, the, the, the problems I have. Again, what was your reaction to that when you read that? Well, when I first read it, I was a bit disappointed. Yeah. I thought, is this really me? But then I thought, well, if it is, then I'm glad it is because I'm learning something about myself I didn't know. Yeah. <clears throat> so I took that point of view that you wouldn't do it because it didn't happen. Yeah. You did it because that's, that's what you found. Yeah. And therefore, you're still finding out about yourself at my age. And, and, and that's something to, I think, be, be aware of and be fond of. So I, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't about to sort of leave the house and, no. in high dudgeon and go and, you <laughs> Stop know, my pocket money. Stop your pocket money. <laughs> matter. No, I mean, I think it's fascinating. And I think that, that families are fascinating. The intertwining of relationships, they, particularly from that generation where we were allowed, not just me, I, we were allowed to actually break free from what well, before had been a convention. You don't yeah. move, you don't shift from it. No. You're down the pit again. You yeah. know? My generation was given the choice. Yes. In many instances, yeah. I was, you know, to get away. Yeah. We did. Yeah. So, you know, from that point of view, no complaints. No, and, and <clears> I suppose also the, the remarkable difference between your relationship with your father and my relationship with yours is, is I had the imposter of fame to deal with, in yeah. a sense, um, which is a strange thing for a child to deal with. When I was lucky because and you were you were hugely famous. If you, the equivalent today would be someone like Beckham, like famous. I mean, that's how, because you were in everyone's household. But I didn't have that terrible thing that, that offspring have nowadays of social media, of people knowing everything. So in a sense, I got away with it. But it did it did have an effect upon me. And, and I, I just was interested when I was going through the research and looking at all the interviews you did, I remembered and saw this one with Jane Fonda, ah. which was a, was a fascinating examination of growing up with a famous father mm. and the difficulty in interrelating. Let's just, just mm. take a look at it. Mm. What was the, the problem then with your father, that he, that he had lacked this intimacy with you? He, he was distant, that he, he was disapproving. Is that the fact? He, 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 well, it's partly generational. How many of you saw um, on Golden Pond? Yeah, we don't look. Yeah. Well, that relationship in the movie between me, Chelsea, and Norman, my father, played by my father, was very parallel to the real life relationship. But did he see the parallels? I mean, I just assumed that he did, but he never told me that he did. So never in all the time that you were with him, that you knew him, did he ever give you the seal of approval, so to speak? He did on your program. Yeah, well, he did. Yeah. In, in, this is the point in 1975. Yeah. Now, you didn't know about that, did you? No. Jane not only is one of the most incredible actresses I've ever seen, 
And I have to say that I'm not surprised because I saw her do things early before she'd committed herself that I thought if she ever did, uh, does want to, she's going to make it. But when I saw Clute as an example, I couldn't wait to sit and talk to her. And this was not father, daughter. This is actor, actor. Now, he never told you that. No, no. <laughs> We've it's all, not you strange, know, though. It's, it's not weird. It, he tells me it, but it won't tell you it. We, we all, or many of us, know parents who are wonderful with strangers. <laughs> yes. You know, just yes. wonderful, especially after a few drinks, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the living room or the bedroom, they, with their intimates, they don't know how to show up. They don't know how to love. It's, uh, I mean, I mean, I've never compared that kind of relationship at all. What, but what, what was interesting about that was about the way that they discovered themselves, bizarrely, their relationship through an interview with you. Oh, yeah. And, and, and which was <laughs> odd. Mm. And, and, it, and, and I suppose what made me think about that was that, that you and your, your dad found each other on the sports field. That's where you came together. That's where mm. you found your, mm. your love for each other. And in a sense, me working with you was a way of discovering each other, mm. you know, that, that way of discovering each other because we share so many attitudes and, and approaches to work. And which is why this book is, has been for me a very interesting exercise because I don't think I could have written this book or been, been involved in this book probably 10 years ago. I think now I could. Um, and in that sense, it's been a, a very um, rewarding experience because I'm able, to, I'm able to say things that are difficult without it being angry. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yes. It, without it being yeah. veiled in bitterness or anger, which yeah. sometimes can happen. So I, I, that's what I thought. I mean, what, what, did, what did you feel? Did you get anything particularly resolved from this book? No, no. I mean, I, 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 I was uh, glad to understand that, basically speaking, that you enjoyed the Sugar yeah. Child and you yeah. enjoyed the warmth and the protection, yeah. if you like, of, of the family. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, listen, I mean, all family uh, affairs are. Uh, eminently uh, writable about. Yeah. I mean, th just think if we banned it, how many great novels would never have been written? <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we're, we're complicated people. We are. And, and, and family structures are very, very complicated indeed. Yeah. And so it's interesting when you actually, because we all say, oh, he's a good man, my dad, a great man, or whatever. But for somebody to forensically examine that statement yeah. and to put you at the center of it and say, you know, really? Yeah, I know. It, it is interesting, particularly given the fact that you always said that this particular title, like Father, like Son, should come with a question mark. Yes, because exactly. you, you're, you're. I mean, you said a very interesting thing. You, you said on 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 Piers Morgan, he asked you very sensitively for Piers uh, why you'd become so upset, and he said, "You said because." My father is a better man than me. Mm, I think he was. Yeah, yeah, uh, because uh, as, as men. Assess manhood, yeah, manliness. <clears throat> he was all the things that I'm not. Really? Yeah, yeah. I believe that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I mean, it, 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 <coughs> what's very interesting, I think, and I just want to just finish <coughs> with a with a with a clip because I do think it's it's a lovely example of of the inarticulacy of love between between, between uh, fathers and sons, and it's a, it's a wonderful moment from your from your show, and and it's one that we use in the book, and it's Val Dunican. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just a, a great example of, well, two things. Um, one, you didn't know this story, did no. you, at all? I always thought that you know, the best advice you would give to an interviewer was to go into an interview knowing more about your guest than yeah. they knew about themselves. Yeah. Uh, that's the, still the only way to do it in my book. And so our research has been formidable and, and forensic. And so when Val walked down the stairs, as far as I was concerned, he's a sorry man, sort of a very nice man, and a good golfer, and let's have a laugh. Right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, halfway through this interview, he started talking about his father. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, there was nowhere in research, no book I read about him, no article, but he'd ever mentioned this story. Yeah. And it was the most moving and profound story about yeah. fatherly love yeah. and things. Yeah. And I ever came across. Yeah. So I don't know what, what you make of that, except to say that, you know, there is in everybody, there's, there's, a, there's a story to be done. There is. And you wouldn't have imagined if you'd looked at you and I having a shouting match about something or other <laughs> that you could ever be as sensitive as you were. No, no. I think that, that this is a, well, the point I'm trying to make yeah. is that you can write about your own life. Yes. But you're never quite sure 
just how personalized that is, just how yes. shifted from the real focus of truth it is. Mm. It's always interesting, therefore, to get somebody like yourself who've yeah. observed it yeah. from afar, yeah. yet near and close, Absolutely. And, and written it as sensitively as you did. Yeah. And I, I, you learn quite a bit from yeah, it. Yeah, and I, I just think it's, it's one of those things where it's the, the, the message, if there is a message in the book, is that no one size fits all when it comes to fathers and sons. No. And that in the end, you know, we, we cobble through and we get through the best we can. Yeah, you may, um, yeah. And, I, and I just think that, that this, this clip is a wonderful example of, of the way that fatherly love can be expressed in the most strange, odd and <laughs> moving ways. Let's take a look. I went down to the hut and I sat down on the step and he said to me, I'd like you to do something for me, son. He said, and I don't want you to tell your mother anything about this. Now, of course, that in our house was impossible because you couldn't do that in an hour without everybody knowing about it. You know, we always said that the first up in the morning was the best dressed. You know, but, <laughs> but uh, he said to me, he handed me a, a two pound jam jar and he said to me, and a scissors, a pair of scissors. And he said, I want you to go out now, he said, to Luby Lane. There's a little little lane near my house where court and cobbles used to go. It was all covered in blackberry bars, which wasn't very good for the court and cobbles. But <laughs> he, uh, he said to me, I want you to go up Luby Lane, he said, and the blackberry briars are just coming into bloom. He said, and I want you to cut the little blossoms off the end and put them into the jam jar and bring them back to me. Now, he said, don't tell your mother anything about this. And I said, what are they for? And he used to go, shh, mum's the word. He said, off you go. So I went and I got these blackberry briars and I brought them back to him. And uh, still waiting to see what was going to happen. And he just took them and he said, off you go now, go on, off you go. And the next morning, we didn't have a bathroom, you see, and there was a tap on the wall out in the yard. And I went out there to get some water to wash myself to go to school. And my mother said, empty out some rubbish for her. And I emptied this into the dustbin. And there in the bottom of the dustbin were the blackberry briars, all in a little heap, and they were all wet and everything. And I thought, what? There's gratitude for you. He's just thrown them all out. Now, about 15 years after that, I think, I was on tour in Scotland, Annie. I was in a show up in Scotland with, and with, uh, with Jack Ratcliffe, I think. Oh, yes. yes. And I was touring with Jack Ratcliffe's show. And I came back to me digs one night, and I was looking through some old books while I was waiting for my beans on toast after the show. And I looked at this book, and it was called The Home Physician. And I turned over, and I was absolutely sickened. I saw written down there, it was widely believed in country districts in Ireland many years ago that if you cut the ends off blackberry briars and boiled them and drank the water off them, it would cure cancer of the throat. Oh. Well, I nearly died. I mean, I was yes. thinking of my poor dad, and he was oh. down in this shed all on his own, you know. He had cancer in the throat. He knew he was dying, and he didn't want to upset me, Mum, you know. He didn't want to sort of tell her. And the loneliness of the whole thing, I, could, I burst out crying when I read it. I couldn't believe it. Amazing story. And he finally, he finally went into hospital, actually. And I used to go and see him every day when I came up to school. I used to go up to see him. And my mother used to send him up his tobacco and his matches and the daily paper and everything. And I used to take them up to him. And as time went on, I mean, his whole face sort of disappeared, bless him. And he was, he was all in bandages. His whole head was in bandages. But the last thing he said to me has got to be the most profound thing I've ever heard in my life. I, I sat by the bed talking to him, and he said to me, you know I'm going to die, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. I said, Mum told me you were going to die. Well, he said, I think I'm going to die pretty quickly, he said, so I would like it if you didn't come and see me anymore. And I said, OK. And then he said, well, I got up to say goodbye to him. And he said, before you go, he said, there's something I think I should say to you. Now, he said, you think I'm terrific, don't you? And I said, yes, I do. Well, he said, I think before I die, it's only fair if I should tell you that I'm not. <laughs> because he said, when I'm gone, he said, I'm sure a lot of people will tell you I'm no good, and there's nothing would please me more than for you to say, yes, I know, he told me that himself. Dear old Arthur Marshall, Arthur Marshall I don't know if you remember him. That That's right. shop. You know, that, I mean, that was extraordinary, wasn't yeah, it? it was. Extraordinary definition of, of, uh, yeah. of love. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, you, 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 uh, you were with your, 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 your dad, you were with my granddad when he was, was dying because he came home to die, mm. didn't he? Mm. And um, he said he had a wonderful thing on his, on his deathbed, didn't he, to you? Because you, uh, you were with him and uh, you started to talk about, about your life. Mm. And he said a great thing, didn't he, about about how you, how what he thought about your achievements in your life, didn't he? Yes, we were talking about about you know generally about the life and and, and the, then Germany he had meeting Muhammad Ali and all that sort of thing, and uh, and then he said um, you're doing well. I said no, I've, I have been all right. I yeah, I've enjoyed. It. I said you made a bit of money. 
I said, no, that's true. He said, you've become very famous. I said, that's true too. He said, and, and generally speaking, he said, uh, you've had a happy marriage and all that. I said, yeah, that's true. I said, I also have a very good parent. Oh, why? He said, that's absolutely right. He said, mustn't forget that, he said. But he said, I have to ask you this one question. It's not like playing cricket with Yorkshire, is it? <laughs> and in that moment, he defined the difference between fame and something bigger than that. He did, you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah he did. Um, and that's what he felt. Yeah. I mean, to my dad, no matter what I'd done, I was not a failure, but no. I was a disappointment in that I'd yeah. not worn the white rose of Yorkshire yes. on my cricket cap. And uh, and that's summed up in many ways for me, his philosophy of life. He did. Well, in, in all the senses, we, we were all failures in his eyes yeah. because he had three <laughs> grandsons. And despite the fact that he moved my your eldest son, my oldest brother, he moved... <laughs> my mother went pregnant to a house into a, a nursing home in Wakefield oh, God. To, to make sure he was born in Yorkshire. I was working in, in the Daily Express in London at that time. Yeah. I just left the Manchester Guardian and we're doing all right. We're tramming along and Mary was pregnant for the first time and we got into a nice deal in a, in a, a nursing home in Manchester where we'd been previously when I worked on the Guardian. And then uh, I got a phone call one day with about a couple of months ago Right, my dad, he said, right, he said, I just wanted to tell you that job's done. <laughs> I said, what job's that? He said, Mary. I said, what about Mary? Well, he said, I've, I've had a move. I said, move from where? <laughs> he said, I've had a move from that nursing home in Manchester to one in Yorkshire. <laughs> and I said, well, why would you want to do that? Why do I... Do you know what happened if you were born in Lancashire? <laughs> I said, no, Dad, I don't know. Tell me. He said, she, he can play for bloody Yorkshire Creed, he said, because in those days, yes. you had to be born Absolutely. in Yorkshire play. Absolutely. And I said, game set and match. That's very know. true. I mean, he, he was he was taken from us before his time because <laughs> of the the legacy he took with him from, from the mine. But yeah. I don't think he, he, he died a, a happy man, apart from possibly... Spending time watching cricket in Australia, Sydney with you. I think he was a very content man. Yeah, I think he'd done most things he wanted I think he to had, do. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so. he, he is. Uh, in, in the book, he, he it is a remarkable man, and and I know from my point of view, getting to know him more is has actually humbled me when I think of what he did, mm. when I think of what he sacrificed, so that not only that you could do what you wanted to do, but it allowed me to be who I am, mm. and I think that's always a salutary lesson if ever you look back and think oh I was a bit hard done by you think well just look back a couple of generations you're not that hard done by <laughs> that's you. right you and really are not and I think that your contribution to the book your major contribution yeah. was that history of, of mining and yeah. what the job was like and of course people forget about the terrible reputation miners had yes and the awful things people said about them absolutely what did Nancy Astor yes they well, well they, they, when they went out on strike because God forbid they were worried about working conditions and she said what do those troublesome earthworms want now <laughs> <laughs> which you know is uh, is an awful thing it was and, and to think that my grandfather went through that and my grandfather worked through the most febrile period of, of mining history, the mm. First World War, the Second World War, the, the Wall Street crash, everything that happened, mm. the, the general strikes, and he was through all of it, you know, mm. and he experienced it. You, you, you know, you, I think you remember in the early days, you remember him being on strike and you remember, pickets. you know, the pickets Outside. and all that. And, you know, it, and he, he just was never affected by it. No. Extraordinary man, no. he really was. Well, it's been, I, I, I love working about, uh, writing about the book, uh, and I'm glad you, you've enjoyed it. It as works well. very well. Yeah, um, and I, I hope that you, you uh, enjoy it. I hope that you've enjoyed the book, and I hope you enjoyed this little chat about my grandfather and Sir Michael's father. Thank you very much for watching, and good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.